I'm kicking off this new series comparing two of the heaviest hitters in the JRPG genre. I'll be reviewing, comparing, and contrasting Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy on a game-to-game -game basis to find out which series had the better games for each installment. For this series, I'll be focusing on the most recent and accessible versions of each game. So in this case, we'll be talking about the mobile or Switch version of Dragon Quest 1 and the pixel remaster of Final Fantasy 1. If you enjoy these videos and would like to see more and support the channel, remember to like, subscribe, and turn notifications to all. Let me know which of these two you prefer and why in the comments. Now let's begin. Originally released as Dragon Quest in Japan back in 1986, also called Dragon Warrior here in North America back in 1989, Dragon Quest took inspiration from both Ultima and tabletop RPGs, but simplified the gameplay so it could be enjoyed by everyone. The basis for what we now refer to as the JRPG, in Dragon Quest you play as the descendant of the great hero known to the world as Erdrick. You start your journey in the King's Throne Room where he speaks of the evils that have taken control of the world and kidnapped his daughter, Princess Gwalyn. It's up to you and you alone as you scour the land of Alephgard, searching for Erdrick's legendary sword and armor, and the materials needed to create the mystical Rainbow Bridge, which gives you access to the evil Dragon Lord's home base, Charlock Castle. Despite being a fairly simple game that consists mainly of going from town to town on a quest for items, since you are the only playable character, the original Dragon Quest can get pretty tough if you aren't properly prepared. Each town has better armor and weaponry than the last, they conveniently happen to jack up the prices at the inns in each town as you progress as well. In order to better yourself, you must do battle with a variety of well-designed and iconic monsters. The monsters and NPC dialogue is what holds most of this game's charm, and drives you to push forward so you can see the next batch of monsters and meet the next town folk. The legend of your ancestor Erdrick is also looming in the background, giving you something you feel like you need to live up to in the eyes of the people. You must slay the infamous green dragon in order to rescue the princess and carry her back to her castle, then take on the ever so sleepy golem guarding the giant town of Cantlin, and finally face off against the knight aberrant in order to get Erdrick's armor before setting off to Charlock Castle. Once you're leveled and geared up enough to head off to Charlock Castle, you must first obtain the Sunstone, the Lyre of Ire to trade for the Staff of Rain, the Lyre of Ire can also be used to force Force a monster encounter when used, basically an early version of the whistle ability we'll see in later Dragon Quest games. The Princess's Pledge, which helps you locate the Mark of Erdrick, and with the Mark of Erdrick as proof of your ancestry, this old dude at a shrine south of Remalder will combine your items to create the Rainbow Drop, which is used to create the aforementioned Rainbow Bridge. As you level up, you'll gain stats and new spells to help you on your journey. Some used in battle, like the powerful Sizzle Fire spell, and Mid Heal, which can heal you big time both in and out of combat. There's other spells like Glow, which illuminate dark caverns so you can see as you make your way through, and of course the incredibly useful Evac and Zoom spells, which both immediately take you outside of any dungeons or caves, and whisk you back to Tantacle Castle respectively. After you've built the Rainbow Bridge and journeyed into Charlock Castle, you've got to locate the hidden staircase that leads down into the Dragon Lord's lair. Strangely enough, once inside the basement levels of the castle, you can find Erdrick's legendary sword, which will aid you greatly in your battle against the final boss. If you can survive the onslaught of power, powerful monsters in these catacombs, you may then meet up with the Dragon Lord himself, who offers you half the world if you'd be willing to join him. This is where the two main endings were originally determined. In the original NES version, joining him would get you a game over screen, and actually leads to the events of Dragon Quest Builders. In the mobile and Switch version, you'll wake up as if it was some sort of bad dream or nightmare. Choose to do battle with him, and you'll begin the final boss fight. The Dragon Lord is fairly tough and can hit you with snooze, which can put you to sleep and allow him to tee off on you, pelting you with free shots. Once you defeat him, the JRPG trope of transforming boss fights begins here. He'll transform from a powerful Dragovian looking wizard into a giant purple fire breathing dragon. The Dragon Lord's true form is an absolute force to be reckoned with, but if you're properly monitoring your health and keep hitting him with attacks, you'll eventually beat his ass and obtain the Sphere of Light, which restores peace back to the land. One thing I absolutely love about the Dragon Quest games is what I call the Victory Lab, where you get to actually leave the final dungeon and do a tour of the newly restored world that you yourself have saved, speaking to all the townsfolk and hearing what they have to say about your success. Once you've finished basking in your victory, you head back to Tantacle Castle, where King Lorik himself congratulates you and offers you his kingdom. But being the total badass you are, you refuse and head off with the princess to create your own kingdom. Dragon Quest is a total classic that, despite being a bit simplified, still holds up today. It both formed and broke boundaries of what we thought possible in gaming back when it came out, and even though it's such an old game, it actually has multiple different endings depending on what order you do things, or if you do them at all. The music, monsters, and journey are all iconic today, 
but I do feel like this Switch and mobile version is a bit inferior to previous remakes like the one on the Super Famicom. The game still holds up, but how will it compare to the start of another legendary JRPG franchise in Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster? Final Fantasy was originally released in Japan back in 1987, over a year and a half after the original Dragon Quest. It came out here in North America several years later in 1990. Created by the great Hironobu Sakaguchi, who was inspired by Ultima and Wizardry, but shut down by Square until they had seen how successful Dragon Quest was in Japan. Once given the go-ahead, Sakaguchi created this gigantic world with a customizable party of four. In Final Fantasy, you begin the game by creating and naming your four main party members, and then choosing from a variety of what are now known as job classes. Most people name their characters after themselves and some friends, but the classes available to you are Warrior, Thief, Monk, Red Mage, White Mage, and Black Mage. I personally hate mages, so I usually go with Thief, Warrior, Red Mage, and Monk. Not to say the black and white mages aren't useful or iconic, I just prefer not to rely on magic if I can avoid it. The game opens up by showing the devastation brought to the world once the light was removed from the four great crystals. The world is supported by the four crystals and their elements, earth, fire, water, and wind. Legend has it that one day, four warriors of light with crystals in hand will appear and save the world from darkness. Your party members start outside of Cornelia, and after approaching the king, learn that a knight named Garland has gone rogue, abducted his daughter Princess Sarah, and fled to an old shrine to the north known as the Chaos Shrine. After the king promises to expedite the rebuilding of the bridge outside of Cornelia if they can rescue the princess, the crystal bearers head off to face the mighty Garland. After leaving the castle and buying some gear, you'll find that magic in Final Fantasy doesn't work the same as it does in most JRPGs, and instead uses the Dungeons and Dragons style, where you have a certain amount of uses of each level of magic until you're able to rest. From what I remember, this is the only Final Fantasy game that does this, so I figured it was worth mentioning. The Pixel Remaster has options for 4 times EXP and Gil, which makes replaying this game a breeze, but try not to get carried away, lest you become too powerful, rendering boss fights a bit disappointing. After meeting up with Garland, he mentions aspirations of taking over the Kingdom of Cornelia. You lay the smackdown on his ass, rescue the princess, and head across the bridge on your way to the port town of Provoca. But not before we get to see one of the most iconic scenes in the game as you set off on your journey. In Provoca, you learn that a group of pirates are pissing off all the locals, so you beat their asses and take their boat to set sail for the land of the elves. Once there, you learn that a curse has been put on their king, keeping him locked up in a deep sleep. You go and meet some guy to the north, who is definitely not the dark elf ass toss, and he tells you that if you get the crown from the nearby cavern, he'll be able to break the curse. So you go spelunking, retrieve the crown, and give it to this seemingly helpful chum who shockingly is revealed to be the dark elf Astos. You smack around he drops the crystal eye which you need to bring to the blind witch Matoya north of Cornelia. Once she gets the crystal eye she can see again and gives you a special tonic which awakens the king of the elves. After saving the elf king it's off to the dwarves. Living underground one of the dwarves asks if he can use your nitro powder to blow a hole in one of the caves which opens up a path to the rest of the world's oceans. It's time to set sail to new lands. The first place you encounter is the town of Melmond, where you'll notice the ground and plants have all been rotted away due to the light being removed from the earth crystal. So you load up on gear and head to the cavern of earth where you beat up a vampire who drops a star ruby, which thankfully for us are a favorite snack of titans. After giving the titan his num nums, he moves aside, allowing you passage through to meet with an old sage who hands you the earth rod, which is used to open up the next floors of the cavern of earth, leading you to the earth crystal chamber, where you must face off against the first of the four fiends who were sent to defend the crystals from those who would revive them. After fighting and defeating the first of the four fiends, you bring light back to the earth crystal and save the land from rotting. Now it's off to Crescent Lake to hear about the legend of the four fiends and the crystal bears, as well as get your hands on a fancy new canoe which will allow you to travel up small streams and rivers. I freaking love the little canoe and the generic little grey man who rows it. I also love the whole Crescent Lake trope that so many JRPGs have. Dragon Quest had Remalder, which is more of a moat really, but Final Fantasy has Crescent Lake and we'll definitely encounter more of these as we progress through both series. Anyways, the Warriors of Light take their fine-ass canoe and head toward Mount Gulg, which has the best theme in this already incredible soundtrack.
In Mount Gull, you've got to walk through lava until you face off against a red dragon, who isn't nearly as cool as our pal the green dragon from Dragon Quest, so you waste his ass without any issues and head to the Fire Crystal Chamber, a place I've been to in real life, believe it or not, at the Artnia Square Enix Barn Cafe in Shinjuku, Tokyo. Be sure to check it out if you're ever in Japan. They've got strong elixir drinks and fantastic pancakes. Unfortunately, the fire fiend Merilith isn't as hospitable, and instead of hard liquor and pancakes, she whips out her multiple blades and tries to off your party. Thankfully, she's no match for your bromance and Reiner's ice spells, and you defeat her so you can bring the light back to the fire crystal. Now it's off to the ice cave to grab the Levastone. After falling through the ice a few times and getting lost, you grab the Levastone, which you use to unearth the ancient airship from the desert south of Crescent Lake. You now have full access to the world map in your fancy new airship. On your travels, you find some random ass holes in the ground. Upon entering, you find an ancient race of dragons who say that if you can obtain the item from the Citadel of Trials, the Dragon King will grant you great powers. So it's off to the Citadel of Trials. This place is full of warp puzzle shenanigans, but once you find your way, you'll obtain the most sought after item in all the land. The, uh, Rat Tail. Which, believe it or not, was somehow a popular hair trend at the time of this game's original release. Unfortunately. Thankfully, I was above such trends and peasantry. No, instead of a rat tail, I had the luxury of growing up with a mullet. Those things will never go out of style, am I right, guys? Take your fashionable rat tail or mullet or what have you to the Dragon King Bahamut, and he graces you with a class upgrade for all your party members. The warrior becomes a knight, the thief becomes a ninja, the red mage becomes a red wizard, and your already OP monk becomes an even more OP master. I know Kung Fu. You thought you were beaten ass before? Well, now you're twice as strong and can use new equipment and spells. Next, the Warriors of Light rescue a fairy from a caravan and free it back to its pond in Gaia where it gives you the Powered by the air you breathe, activated by the water that you and I drink. OxyClean. The OxyClean. Allows you to breathe underwater and just in time for this random lady who yeets herself into the sea to gift you with a sketchy ass barrel with a snorkel that you use as a submarine. Using this to get to the sunken shrine, you loot and toot this place of all its treasure to find the Rosetta Stone, and then head to the Water Crystal Chamber and face off against the Water Fiend, Kraken. Kraken can mess your ass up with ink and can dull your lightning attacks, but have no fear, Hakko's here. After your master gives Lich the fisting of a lifetime, you'll reignite the Water Crystal. Three down, one to go. The heroes find a warp cube in a waterfall near Onrak and use it to teleport up to the Flying Fortress atop the Tower of Mirage. Here, if you're lucky, you'll get to face off against Warmech, Final Fantasy V's super boss. But the odds are like 3 out of 64 chances you'll show up as a random encounter. Now it's time to face the final elemental fiend, Tiamat. Tiamat's pretty cool, but you can't let that dissuade you from kicking its ass. Beat him up, relight the wind crystal, and ponder the orb to reveal the central location of which their leader lies, the Chaos Shrine. That's right, it's back to where it all started, baby. Once back at the Chaos Shrine, you use the four crystals to open up a gateway to 2,000 years in the past. The Warriors of Light jump in, scale the Chaos Shrine, refight all of the four fiends in their stronger state, then come face to face with Chaos himself. Chaos in this version of the game is an absolute nightmare. I'm talking need to grind 25 more levels than I came into this dungeon at nightmare. But once you beat his ass in an intense final showdown, you get to enjoy the post-game tech scroll and credits. Final Fantasy is another classic like Dragon Quest and has shown a ton of love in these modern pixel remaster releases. Holding as true as possible to the original release while updating and adding a ton of quality of life improvements to the game, they even got the original sprite designer to redesign the classic sprites to look similar but better on modern high definition screens. I wasn't the biggest fan of Final Fantasy 1 on the NES, but have loved this game since the PS1 release in Final Fantasy Origins back in the day, and I'd argue that the Pixel Remaster is the best version of this game due to the fact that it doesn't change much from the original other than adding quality of life and graphical improvements. I'm the kind of guy who wants to appreciate art the way the artist had originally intended, and I feel like Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster did that excellently. So, with that being said, who takes the win here in the first matchup between Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy? I mentioned loving both, but would have to admit that it was Dragon Warrior on the NES that got me into JRPGs as I grew up playing it. Even being swayed by nostalgia, however, I had to give the win to Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster here. There was just so much more love and care put into this release, whereas Dragon Quest on the Switch and mobile really feels a bit watered down compared to the Super Famicom version. Even if it was the best version of Final Fantasy versus the best version of Dragon Quest, I'd still have to give it to Final Fantasy. Remember, Dragon Quest was basically a blueprint that Final Fantasy used to become what it was. They made it a much larger experience with a larger customizable party and a better story as well. 
I love both of these games, but it wasn't too difficult for me to choose between these two. The next part of this series, however, matches up possibly the worst games both of these franchises have to offer. Tune in next time where I'll be reviewing, contrasting, and comparing Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy 2 to find out which is the best. Please like, subscribe, turn notifications to all, and share this video around to help out the channel if you enjoyed it. Also, let me know which of the two you prefer and why in the comments below. You can also hang out live while we stream our way through all the Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest games right here on YouTube, Tuesday and Thursday nights. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you in the next one.